Hi students, welcome to the final um, lecture about an enemy of the people. We are going to be going over Act 3 today in hopes that it will help you uh, create a really good last discussion piece over this literature. So we start off, um, we are back in Dr. Stockman's home. However, uh, the home looks a lot different than the first time that we encountered it. It's after the riot and the town speech, and clearly uh, they essentially booed Dr. Stockman off the stage. So the home is really disheveled. The windows are broken. Uh, there's a lot of disorder, including in the lives of Dr. Stockman's family. So we see uh, right here on page uh, 65, Dr. Stockman is talking to Catherine and he says, Catherine, uh, tell what's her name that there are still some rocks to pick up in here. And Mrs. Stockman says she's not finished sweeping up the glass. And I want to draw attention to this because we saw this in act two as well, that clearly Dr. Stockman uh, does not remember the housekeeper's name. It's someone who's around his family all the time. And I'm just wondering, uh, what does this say about his character, his views on women? And while we love Dr. Stockman and we've come to appreciate him for his moral compass, can we fault him? Can we find some character flaws that even uh, this great protagonist uh, holds? So then uh, right here on 65, Dr. Stockman, a little boy comes by and he takes a rock and he throws it through one of the last windows that are left. And Dr. Stockman says, a little boy, look at him run. He picks up the stone, how fast the poison spreads even to the children. This points out the idea that parents really teach their children this idea of hate and anger. While the children are not old enough to choose ideas on their own, they are old enough to see and understand what's being modeled for them. So Miller uh, uses this little boy to point out that very, very important idea. So then on page uh, 66, we see that the Stockmans uh, have been evicted from their home. Um, the landlord is saying they can no longer live there. And then Mr. Stockman brings up this idea of going to America. And he says, well, it just shows you that's all. When a man goes to fight for the truth, he should never wear his best pants. <laughs> Excuse me. He calms her. Stop worrying, will you? We'll sew them up. And in no time, we'll be 3,000 miles away. But how do you know it'll be any different there? It seems to me in a big country like that, that the spirit must be bigger. I suppose they must have a solid majority there too. I don't know. At least there'll be more room to hide there. And Mrs. Stockman says, think about it more, will you? I'd hate to go halfway around the world and find out that we're in the same place. It's really interesting being a reader in America reading this because as we know, America is not a perfect country. It's not a country where uh, democracy is always a good thing and where uh, we exhibit the principles of democracy always. We see flaws in our own country. So it's interesting as we're reading this to realize that uh, countries all over the world, even democratic countries, are struggling with truth and morale and what really uh, creates a true democracy. And then we come to find out at the end of this page that Petra has been let go from her job. And then as we scroll down to 68, Captain Horster has uh, entered into the room. And uh, we see that he begins talking, Dr. Stockman begins talking about going to America and really excited about it. And unfortunately, uh, Dr. Stockman says, when do you set sail, Captain? And Horster said, that's really what I wanted to come talk to you about. Why? Has something happened to the ship? You see, we can't go. No, the ship will sail, but I won't be aboard. No, 
You fired too, because I was this morning. Oh, Captain, you shouldn't have given us your house. Oh, I'll get another ship. It's just that the owner, Mr. Vic, happens to be in the same party as the mayor. And I suppose when you belong to a party and the party takes a certain position, because Mr. Vic himself is a very decent man. Guys, this answers the question uh, that we ask ourselves uh, what drives these people to make these decisions? What drived Petra's uh, professor to fire her from her job? Is it really that they believe in these ideas that the party stands for? Or is it a fear-based action? Do they treat people poorly? Do they fire innocent people? because they see what power and authority can do. You know, in the previous act, all of these people, the landlord, Petra's supervisor, Captain Horster's owner of the ship, they all saw what happened at this riot that was occurring. And so there's a certain fear that I'm sure that they have where if they go against these people, what is going to become of them? What is gonna become of their family? So it brings this idea that even decent people are driven to fear for themselves, their families, and their livelihood. So we go to page 70, and uh, we see that Peter enters in. And Dr. Stockman uh, says to him, keep your hat on if you like. It's a little drafty in here today. And we see that there, Arthur Miller's really using a play on words there. If we think back to the beginning of the play where they really wanted Peter to come in and take off his hat and take off his coat and join the family. And we see that the mood has drastically shifted. And Peter comes telling Dr. Stockman uh, that he has lost his job, that he will no longer uh, get to be a doctor. And then on page 71 and 72, we see the conversation between the two men. And Peter says, let me have a signed statement that in your zeal to help the town, you went overboard and exaggerated. Put it any way you like, just so you calm anybody who might feel nervous about the water. If you give me that, you've got your job and I'll give you my word. You can gradually make all the improvements you feel are necessary. Now that gives you what you want. And Dr. Stockman says, you're nervous, Peter. And Peter says, I'm not nervous. And Dr. Stockman says, you expect me to remain in charge while people are being poisoned? In time, you can make your changes. When? Five, 10 years? You know your trouble, Peter? You don't grasp that even now there are certain men you can't buy. So clearly we see Peter has come in here willing to pay, essentially pay off Dr. Stockman to recant his statement to put the town at rest, to take back his job. And he's offering Dr. Shockman peace and authority uh, in the process of all of that. So Peter brings up uh, this new idea that Dr. Shockman did not realize. And he says, I'm quite capable of understanding that, but you don't happen to be one of those men. And he's referring to buying him off. And Dr. Stockman says, what do you mean by that? And Peter says, you know exactly what I mean by that. Morton Kill is what I mean by that. Morton Kill, your father-in-law, Morton Kill. I swear, Peter, one of us is out of his mind. What are you talking about? Now don't try to charm me with your professional innocence. What are you talking about? You don't know that your father-in-law has been running all around all morning buying up stock in Kirsten Springs? Buying up stock? Buying up stock every share he can lay his hands on. Well, I don't understand. What's that got to do? Oh, come on now. Come on. Very well. If you insist on being dense, a man wages a relentless campaign to destroy confidence in a corporation. He even goes so far to call a mass meeting against it. The next morning, when people are in a state of shock, the father-in-law runs around town picking up shares at half their value. And Dr. Stockman realizes what's going on, and he turns away and says, my God. And Peter says, you have the nerve to speak to me about principles. 
So we find out that Morton Kill, after the riots and uh, Dr. Stockman's news to the townspeople that the water has been poisoned, Morton has gone around buying up shares for Kirsten Springs for the people that are fearful that Dr. Stockman could be on to something, that he could be right. So Peter leaves. He's angry. He is determined that Dr. Stockman knew this was going on. And then Kill enters into the home. And Dr. Stockman says, Morton, what have you done? What is the matter with you? Do you realize what this makes me look like? And Dr. Stockman says, is that them? And Kill says, yes, Kirsten Spring shares. Very easy to get this morning. Morton, don't play with me. What is all this about? What are you so nervous about? Can a man buy some stock without, I want an explanation, Morton. Thomas, they hated you last night. You don't have to tell me that, but they also believed you. They'd love to murder you, but they believe you. The way they say it, the pollution is coming down the river from Windmill Valley. That's exactly where it's coming from. And that's exactly where my tannery is. Dr. Stockman slowly sits down. Well, Morton, I never made it a secret to you that the pollution was tannery waste. I'm not blaming you. It's my fault. I didn't take you seriously, but it's very serious now, Thomas. I got that tannery from my father. He got it from his father and his father got it from my great grandfather. I do not intend to allow my family's name to stand for three generations of murdering angels who poison this town. I've waited a long time for this talk, Morton. Don't you think you can stop that from happening? No, but you can. I, I bought these shares because Morton, you've thrown your money away. The springs are doomed. I never throw my money away, Thomas. These were bought with your money. My money? What? You've probably suspected that I might leave a little something for Catherine and the boys. Well, naturally, I hoped I decided this morning to invest all of that money in stock. You bought that junk with Catherine's money? People call me Badger, and that's an animal that roots thing out things, but it's also some kind of pig, I understand. I've lived a clean man, and I'm going to die clean, and you're going to clean my name for me. Morton. I want to see if you really belong in a straight jacket. How could you do such a thing? What's the matter with you? Now, don't get excited. It's very simple. You should make another investigation of the water. I don't need another investigation. I, if you think it over and decide you ought to change your opinion about the water, but the water is poisoned. If you simply go on insisting the water is poisoned with these in your house, then there's only one explanation for you. You're crazy. You're right. I'm mad. I'm insane. And you're stripping the skin off your family's back. Only a madman would do something like that. Morton, I'm a penniless man. Why didn't you tell me before you bought that junk? Because you would understand better if I told you after. I think you do understand, don't you? Millions of tons of water come down that river. How do you know that the day you made your test, there wasn't something unusual about the water? Uh, yes, but I, how couldn't those little animals have clotted up the only patch of water you souped out of the river? How do you know the rest wasn't pure? It's not probable. People were getting sick last summer. They were sick when they came here or they wouldn't have come. Not intestinal diseases, skin diseases. The only place anyone gets a bellyache is here. There are no carbuncles in Norway. Maybe the food was bad. Did you think about the food? No, I didn't look into the food. Then what makes you sure it was the water? Because I tested the water and admit it, we're alone here. You have doubt. Well, there's always a possible, then part of it's imaginary. Well, nothing's 100%, but you have a scientific right. And did you ever think of disinfectant? I bet you never thought of that. Not for a mass of water like that. You can't, everything can be killed. That's science, Thomas. I never liked your brother either. You have a perfect right to hate him. I didn't do this because I hate my brother. 
part of it, part of it, don't deny it. You admit there's some doubt in your mind, the water, you admit that there may be ways to disinfect it. And yet you went after your brother as though these doubts didn't exist, as though the only way to cure it was to blow up the whole Institute. There's hatred in that boy and don't forget it. These can belong to you now. So be sure, tear the hatred out of your heart and stand naked in front of yourself. Are you sure? Guys, what we see going on here is uh, Morton, essentially the tannery that was causing all of the issues that belongs to he and his father. So Morton wants Dr. Stopman to clear his name that it's his fault, truly, that the springs have been contaminated. So what he's done is he's bought these stocks, stocks up with Catherine's fortune that he was going to leave her and hopes that Dr. Stockman will be scared out of his mind and really persuaded by money to change his mind about science, to change his mind about what he clearly knows is true. So then we see Aslaskin and Hofstad come in. And uh, Kill leaves and Dr. Stockman uh, immediately tells the editor and the printer of the People's Daily Messenger that he wants nothing to do with them. So then uh, Dr. Stockman says, don't beat around the bush. What are you doing here? And Hofstad says, one thing at a time, we couldn't go on supporting you because in simple language, we didn't have the money to withstand the loss in circulation. You're boycotted now. Well, the paper would have been boycotted too if we stuck with you. You can see that, doctor. Oh, yes, but what do you want? The people's messenger can put on a campaign that in two months, you will be hailed the hero in this town. We're ready to go. We will prove to the public that you had to buy up the stock because the management would not make the cha changes required for public health. In other words, you did it for scientific public spirited reasons. Now, what do you say, doctor? You want money from me, is that it? Well, now doctor, no, don't walk around it. If we started to support you again, doctor, we'd lose circulation for a while. We'd like you or Mr. Kill rather to make up the deficit. Now that that's open and above board, I don't see what's wrong with it. Do you? Remember doctor, you need the paper. You need it desperately. No, there's nothing wrong with it at all. I'm not adverse to cleaning up my name, although for myself, it was never dirty. I don't enjoy being hated, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Ask Laskin, show him the budget. Just a minute. There is one point, and I hate to keep repeating the same thing, but the water is poisoned. Now, doctor, just a minute. The mayor says he will levy a tax on everybody to pay for the reconstruction. I assume you're ready to support that tax at the same time that you're supporting me. Oh, well, the tax would be extremely unpopular. Doctor, with you back in charge, I have no fear that anything can go wrong. In other words, you will clean up my name so that I can be in charge of the corruption. But we can't tackle everything at once. And a new tax, there'd be an uproar and it would ruin the paper then you don't intend to do anything about the water. We have faith that you won't let anyone get sick. In other words, gentlemen, you're looking for someone to blackmail into paying your printing bill. We're trying to clear your name, Dr. Stockman, and if you refuse to cooperate, if that's gonna be your attitude, yes, go on. What will you do? I think we'd better go. No, what will you do? I'd like you to tell me, me, the man two minutes ago that you were going to make a hero. What will you do now that I won't pay you? Guys, what we can see here is Dr. Stockman has just been completely cornered. Peter comes in and says if he recants his statement, he can have his job back. Morton Kill comes in and says if you change what you've said, then uh, these stocks that I bought with my doctor's fortune will go up a ton and you'll be a rich man. And now the printing press has come in and said, if you will pay for our printing, then we will make you a hero in the newspaper. But at the end of the day, none of these men plan to change what's factual. None of them plan to change anything about the water. So then we go to... Uh, 
page 82 and we see that Dr. Shotman's sons have come home and they've been beaten. And the teacher is telling them that they probably need to stay home for the week. And Dr. Shockman is just in disarray of what has, what has come to pass, not only for him, but for his family. So Dr. Shockman says to Catherine, I've decided I am an enemy of the people. And Mrs. Stockman says, Tom, what are you to such people who teach their own children to think with their fists? To them, I'm an enemy. And my boys, my boys, my family, I think you can count us all enemies. Doctor, you could have everything you want except the truth. I could have everything but that. The water is poisoned. But you'll be in charge and the children are poisoned. The people are poisoned. The only way I can be a friend of the people is to take charge of this corruption. Then I am an enemy. The water is poisoned, poisoned, poisoned. That's the beginning and that's the end. Now get out of here. So clearly, Dr. Stockman is making a point that no matter what these men do, no matter what these people in authority say that they're going to do, at the end of the day, they cannot change science. They cannot change facts. And the facts are that the water is unsafe, making people sick and poisoned. So on page 83, Dr. Shotman says, they want me to buy the paper, the public, the pollution of the springs, buy the whole pollution of this town. They'll make a hero of me for that. But I'm not a hero. I'm the enemy. And now you're going to find out what kind of enemy I am. I will sharpen my pen like a dagger. You and all your friends of the people are going to bleed before I'm done. Tell them to sign the petitions. Warn them not to call me when they're sick. Beat up my children and never let her in the school again, or she'll destroy the immaculate purity of the vacuum there. See to all the barricades, the truth is coming. Ring the bells and sound the alarm. The truth, the truth is out and it will be prowling like a lion in the streets. Guys, what Dr. Stotman is saying here is he is relentless. He will write, he will get the truth out in some way, no matter what they choose to do to him or his family. So on page 84, Dr. Stockman decides that the family is going to stay in the Norwegian town. He believes that education is going to be the answer. He says, we'll begin, Petra, and we'll turn, not, and we'll turn out not taxpayers and newspaper subscribers, but free and independent people hungry for the truth. Oh, I forgot, Petra, run to grandpa and tell him, tell him as follows, no. What do you mean? I mean, my dear, that we are all alone and there'll be a long night before it's day. Half the town is up. What's going to happen, Tom? What's going to happen? I don't know. But remember now, everybody, you are fighting for the truth and that's why you're alone. And that's what makes you strong. You are the strongest people in the world. And the strong must learn to be lonely. Essentially, guys, when we look at uh, page 84, Dr. Shotman has said to the boys, we must live through this, boys. No more school. I'm going to teach you in Petra. Do you know any kids, street louds, hooky players? Well, one about 12 of them to start, but I want them good and ignorant, absolutely uncivilized. Can I use your house, Captain? Dr. Shotman is planning to start a school and to teach children the truth, to teach them of democracy, to teach them of science. And he wants people that haven't already uh, been swept up in this idea that the majority is always right. That just because there's a mob of angry people that say that something should be doesn't necessarily mean that that is the truth. And he tells his family, we need to be prepared to be lonely in the process of standing up for what's right and the truth. As we in the play, we see so many ideas, challenges, and hardships that we see in our own day-to-day -day lives. What is truth? What is truth without power and authority? Is education and raising up a new generation the answer? This week, we're going to unpack these ideas in our discussion board. 
I look forward to seeing everything that you have to say, and I look forward to uh, writing back to your wonderful responses.